Chapter 2 I have grown much too used to an outside view of myself, to being both painter and model, so no wonder my style is denied the blessed grace of spontaneity. Try as I may I do not succeed in getting back into my original envelope, let alone making myself comfortable in my old self, the disorder there is far too great, things have been moved, the lamp is black and dead, bits of my past litter the floor. Quite a happy past, I dare say. I owned in Berlin a small but attractive flat, three and a half rooms, sunny balcony, hot water, central heating, Lydia, my 30-year-old wife, and Elsie, our 17-year-old maid. Close at hand was the garage where stood that delightful little car, a dark blue two-seater, paid for in installments. On the balcony, a bulging round-headed hoary cactus grew bravely though slowly. I got my tobacco always at the same shop, and was greeted there by a radiant smile. A similar smile welcomed my wife at the store which supplied us with eggs and butter. On Saturday nights we went to a cafe or to the pictures. We belonged to the cream of the smug middle class, or so it would seem. I did not, however, upon coming home from office, take off my shoes to lie down on the couch with the evening paper. Nor did conversation with my wife consist solely of smallish numerals. Nor again did my thoughts always stick to the adventures of the chocolate I made. I may even confess that certain bohemian tastes were not entirely foreign to my nature. As to my attitude toward New Russia, let me declare straight away that I did not share my wife's views. Coming from her painted lips, the term Bolshevik acquired a note of habitual and trivial hatred. No, hatred is, I am afraid, too strong a word here. It was something homely, elementary, womanish, for she disliked Bolsheviks as one dislikes rain on Sundays especially, or bedbugs, especially in new lodgings, and Bolshevism meant to her a nuisance akin to the common cold. She took it for granted that facts confirmed her opinion, the truth was too obvious to be discussed.
Bolsheviks did not believe in God, that was naughty of them, but what else could one expect from sadists and hooligans? When I used to say that communism in the long run was a great and necessary thing, that young, new Russia was producing wonderful values, although unintelligible to Western minds and unacceptable to destitute and embittered exiles, that history had never yet known such enthusiasm, asceticism, and unselfishness, such faith in the impending sameness of us all, when I used to talk like this, my wife would answer serenely, I think you are saying it to tease me, and I think it's not kind. But really I was quite serious for I have always believed that the mottled tangle of our elusive lives demands such essential change, that communism shall indeed create a beautifully square world of identical brawny fellows, broad-shouldered and microcephalous, and that a hostile attitude toward it is both childish and preconceived, reminding me of the face my wife makes, nostrils strained and one eyebrow lifted, the childish and preconceived idea of a vamp, every time she catches sight of herself in the mirror. Now that is a word I loathe, the ghastly thing. I have had none of the article ever since I stopped shaving. Anyway, the mere mention of it has just given me a nasty shock, broken the flow of my story, please imagine what should follow here, the history of mirrors. Then, too, there are crooked ones, monsters among mirrors, a neck bared, no matter how slightly, draws out suddenly into a downward yawn of flesh, to meet which there stretches up from below the belt another marchpane pink nudity and both merge into one. A crooked mirror strips its man or starts to squash him, and lo! There is produced a man bull, a man toad, under the pressure of countless glass atmospheres, or else, one is pulled out like dough and then torn into two. Enough, let us get on, roars of laughter are not in my line. Enough, it is not all so simple as you seem to think, you swine, you. Oh, yes, I am going to curse at you, none can forbid me to curse. and not to have a looking glass in my room, that is also my right. True, even in the event of my being confronted by one Bosch, what have I to fear, it would reflect a bearded stranger, for that beard of mine has done jolly well, and in such a short time too.
I am disguised so perfectly, as to be invisible to my own self. Hair comes sprouting out of every pore. There must have been a tremendous stock of shag inside me. I hide in the natural jungle that has grown out of me. There is nothing to fear. Silly superstition. See here, I am going to write that word again. Mirror. Mirror. Well, has anything happened? Mirror, mirror, mirror. As many times as you like, I fear nothing. A mirror. To catch sight of oneself in a mirror. I was referring to my wife when speaking of that. Difficult to talk if one is constantly interrupted. By the way she, too, was given to superstition. The touchwood fad. Hurriedly, with an air of decision, her lips compressed, she would glance about for some bare, unpolished timber, find only the underside of a table, then touch it with her stumpy fingers, little cushions of flesh round the strawberry bright nails which, the lacquered, were never quite cleaned, the nails of a child, touch it quickly whilst the mention of happiness still hung warm in the air. She believed in dreams, to dream you had lost a tooth portended the death of someone you knew, and if there came blood with the tooth, then it would be the death of a relative. A field of daisies foretold meeting again one's first lover. Pearls stood for tears. It was very bad to see oneself all in white sitting at the head of the table. Mud meant money, a cat, treason, the sea trouble for the soul. She was fond of recounting her dreams, circumstantially and at length. Alas! I am writing of her in the past tense. Let me brace up the buckle of my story one hole tighter. She hates Lloyd George, had it not been for him, the Russian Empire would not have fallen, and, generally, I could strangle those English with my own hands. Germans get their due for that sealed train in which Bolshevism was tinned, and Lenin imported to Russia.
Speaking of the French, do you know, Ardalian, a cousin of hers who had fought with the White Army, says they behaved like downright cads in Odessa during the evacuation. At the same time she considers the English type of face to be after mine, the handsomest on earth, respects Germans because they are musical and steady, and declares she adores Paris, where we once happened to spend a few days. These opinions of hers stand as stiff as statues in their niches. On the contrary, her position in respect to the Russian folk has, on the whole, undergone a certain evolution. In 1920 she was still saying, the genuine Russian peasant is a monarchist, now she says, the genuine Russian peasant is extinct. She is little educated and little observant. We discovered one day that to her the term mystic was somehow dimly connected with mist and mistake and stick, but that she had not the least idea what a mystic really was. The only kind of tree she is capable of identifying is the birch, reminds her of her native woodland, she says. She is a great gobbler of books, but reads only trash, memorizing nothing and leaving out the longer descriptions. She goes for her books to a Russian library, there she seats herself down and is a long time choosing, fumbles at books on the table, takes one, turns its pages, peers into it sideways, like an investigative hen, puts it away, takes up another, opens it, all of which is performed on the table's surface and with the help of one hand only, she notices that she has opened the book upside down, whereupon it is given a turn of 90 degrees, not more, for she discards it to make a dash at the volume which the librarian is about to offer to another the lady, the whole process lasts more than an hour, and I do not know what prompts her final selection. Perhaps the title. Once I brought back from a railway journey some rotten detective novel with a crimson spider amid a black web on its cover. She dipped into it and found it terribly thrilling, felt that she simply could not help taking a peep at the end, but as that would spoil everything, she shut her eyes tight and tore the book in two down its back and hid the second, concluding, portion, then, later, she forgot the place and was a long, long time searching the house for the criminal she herself had concealed, repeating the while in a small voice, it was so exciting, so terribly exciting, I know I shall die if I don't find out.
she has found out now. Those pages that explained everything were securely hidden, still, they were found, all of them except one, perhaps. Indeed, a lot of things have happened, now duly explained. Also that came to pass which she feared most. Of all omens it was the weirdest. A shattered mirror. Yes, it did happen, although not quite in the ordinary way. The poor dead woman. Tum ti tum. And once more, tum. No, I have not gone mad. I am merely producing gleeful little sounds. The kind of glee one experiences upon making an April fool of someone. And a damned good fool I have made of someone. Who is he? Gentle reader, look at yourself in the mirror, as you seem to like mirrors so much. And now, all of a sudden I feel sad, the real thing, this time. I have just visualized, with shocking vividness, that cactus on the balcony, those blue rooms, that flat of ours in one of those newfangled houses built in the modern box-like, space cheating, let us have no nonsense style. And there, in my world of neatness and cleanliness, the disorder Lydia spread, the sweet vulgar tang of her perfume. But her faults, her innocent dullness, her school dormitory habit of having the giggles in bed, did not really annoy me. We never quarreled, never did I make a single complaint to her, no matter what piffle she spouted in public, or how tastelessly she dressed. She was anything but good at distinguishing shades, poor soul. She thought it just right if the main colors matched, this satisfying thoroughly her sense of tone, and so she would flaunt a hat of grass green felt with an olive green or eau de nil dress. She liked everything to be echoed. If, for instance, the sash was black, then she found it absolutely necessary to have some little black fringe or little black frill about her throat. In the first years of our married life she used to wear linen with Swiss embroidery.
she was perfectly capable of putting on a wispy frock together with thick autumn shoes, no, decidedly, she had not the faintest notion of the mysteries of harmony, and this was connected with her being wretchedly untidy. Her slovenliness showed in the very way she walked, for she had a knack of treading her left shoe down at heel. It made me shudder to glance into her chest of drawers where there wreathed higgledy-piggledy a farrago of rags, ribbons, bits of silk, her passport, a wilted tulip, some pieces of moth-eaten fur, sundry anachronisms, gaiters for example, as worn by girls ages ago, and such like impossible rubbish. Quite often, too, there would dribble into the cosmos of my beautifully arranged things some tiny and very dirty lace handkerchief or a solitary stocking, torn. Stockings seemed positively to burn on those brisk calves of hers. Not a jot did she understand of household matters. Her receptions were dreadful. There would always be, in a little dish, broken bars of milk chocolate as offered in poor provincial families. I sometimes used to ask myself, what on earth did I love her for? Maybe for the warm hazel iris of her fluffy eyes, or for the natural side wave of her brown hair, done anyhow, or again for that movement of her plump shoulders. But probably the truth was that I loved her because she loved me. To her I was the ideal man, brains, pluck. And there was none dressed better. I remember, once, when I first put on that new dinner jacket, with the vast trousers, she cast her hands, sank down on a chair and murmured, Oh, Herman. It was ravishment bordering upon something like heavenly woe. with, perhaps, the ill-defined feeling that by further embellishing the image of the man she loved, I was meeting her halfway, and doing her and her happiness a good turn, I took advantage of her confidence and during the ten years we lived together told her such a heap of lies about myself, my past, my adventures, that it would have been beyond my powers to hold it all in my head, always ready for reference. But she used to forget everything. Her umbrella stayed with all our acquaintances in turn, her lipstick turned up in incomprehensible places such as her cousin's shirt pocket, the thing she had read in the morning paper would be told me at night somewhat as follows.
Let me see, where did I read it, and what was it exactly? I just had it by the tail, oh, please, do help me. Giving her a letter to post was equal to throwing it into the river, leaving the rest to the acumen of the stream and the recipient's piscatorial leisure. She mixed dates, names, faces. After having invented something I never returned to it, she soon forgot, the story sank to the bottom of her consciousness, but there remained on the surface the ever-renewed rings of humble wonder. Her love almost crossed the boundary limiting all the rest of her feelings. On certain nights, when June and Moon rhymed, her most settled thoughts turned into timid nomads. It did not last, they did not wander far, the world was locked again, and a very simple world it was, with the greatest complication in it amounting to a search for the telephone number which she had jotted down on one of the pages of a library book, borrowed by the very person whom she wished to ring up. She loved me without reservations, without retrospection, her devotion seemed part of her nature. I do not know why I have lapsed again into the past tense, but never mind, my pen finds it more convenient so. Yes, she loved me, loved me faithfully. She liked to examine my face this way and that, with finger and thumb, compasswise, she measured my features, the somewhat prickly area above the upper lip, with the longish groove down the middle, the spacious forehead with its twin swellings above the brows, and the nail of her index finger would follow the lines on both sides of my mouth, which was always shut tight and insensitive to tickling. A big face and none too simple, modeled by special order, with a gloss on the cheekbones, the cheeks themselves slightly hollowed and, on the second shaveless day, overspread with a brigandish growth, reddish in certain lights, exactly the same as his beard. Our eyes alone were not quite identical but what likeness did exist between them was a mere luxury, for his were closed as he lay on the ground before me, and though I have never really seen, only felt, my eyelids when shut, I know that they differed in nothing from his eyes, a good word, that. Ornate, but good, and a welcome guest to my prose. No, I am not getting in the least excited, my self-control is perfect.
If every now and again my face pops out, as from behind a hedge, perhaps to the prim reader's annoyance, it is really for the latter's good, let him get used to my countenance, and in the meantime I shall be chuckling quietly over his not knowing whether it was my face or that of Felix. Here I am, and now, gone again, or maybe it was not I. Only by this method can I hope to teach the reader a lesson, demonstrating to him that ours was not an imaginary resemblance, but a real possibility, even more, a real fact, yes, a fact, however fanciful and absurd it might seem. On coming back from Prague to Berlin, I found Lydia in the kitchen engaged in beating an egg in a glass, goggle moggle, we called it. Throaty aches, she said in a childish voice, then put down the glass upon the edge of the stove, wiped her yellow lips with the back of her wrist and proceeded to kiss my hand. She had on a pink frock, pinkish stockings, dilapidated slippers. The evening sun checkered the kitchen. Again she started to turn the spoon in the thick yellow stuff, grains of sugar crunched slightly, it was still clammy, the spoon did not move smoothly with the velvety ovality that was required. On the stove lay open a battered book. There was a note scribbled in the margin by some person unknown, with a blunt pencil, sad, but true, followed by three exclamation marks with their respective dots skidding. I perused the phrase that had appealed so much to one of my wife's predecessors, love thy neighbor, said Sir Reginald, is nowadays not quoted on the stock exchange of human relations. Well, had a good trip, asked Lydia as she went on energetically turning the handle, with the box part held firm between her knees. The coffee beans crackled, richly odorous, the mill was still working with a rumbling and creaking effort, then came an easing, a yielding, gone all resistance, empty. I have got muddled somehow. As in a dream. She was making that goggle moggle, not coffee. Could have been worse, I said, referring to the trip. And you, how are you getting on? Why did I not tell her of my incredible adventure?
I, who would fake wonders for her by the million, seemed not to dare, with those polluted lips of mine, tell her of a wonder that was real. Or maybe something else withheld me. An author does not show people his first draft, a child in the womb is not referred to as Tiny Tom or Belle, a savage refrains from naming objects of mysterious import and uncertain temper, Lydia herself disliked my reading a book she had not yet finished. For several days I remained oppressed by that meeting. It oddly disturbed me to think that all the time my double was trudging along roads unknown to me, and that he was underfed and cold and wet, and perhaps had caught a chill. I longed for him to find work, it would have been sweeter to know that he was snug and warm, or at least safe in prison. All the same it was not at all my intention to undertake any such measures as might improve his circumstances. I was not in the least keen to pay for his upkeep, and it would have been impossible to find him a job in Berlin, swarming as it was with ragamuffins. Indeed, to be quite frank, I found it somehow preferable to hold him at a certain distance from me as though any proximity would have broken the spell of our likeness. From time to time I might send him a little money lest he should slip and perish in the course of his far wanderings and thus cease to be my faithful representative, a live circulating copy of my face. Kind but idle thoughts, for the man had no permanent address. So let us tarry, thought I, until, on a certain autumn day, he calls at that village post office somewhere in Saxony. May passed, and in my mind the memory of Felix healed up. I note for my own pleasure the smooth run of that sentence, the banal narratory tone of the first two words, and then that long sigh of imbecile contentment. Sensation lovers, however, might be interested to observe that, generally speaking, the term heal up is employed only when alluding to wounds. But this is only mentioned in passing, no harm meant. Now there is something else I should like to note, namely, that writing with me has become an easier matter, my tale has gained impetus. I have now boarded that bus, mentioned at the beginning, and, what is more, I have a comfortable window seat.
and thus too, I used to drive to my office before I acquired the car. That summer it had to work pretty hard, the shiny blue little Icarus. Yes, I was quite taken by my new toy. Lydia and I would often buzz away for the whole day to the country. We always took with us that cousin of hers called Ardalian, who was a painter, a cheery soul, but a rotten painter. By all accounts he was as poor as the sparrow. If people did have their portraits done by him, it was sheer charity on their part, or weakness of character, the man could be hideously insistent. From me, and probably also from Lydia, he used to borrow small cash, and of course he contrived to stay for dinner. He was always behind with his rent, and when he did pay it, he paid it in kind. In still life to be precise, square apples on a slanting cloth, or phallic tulips in a leaning vase. All this his landlady would frame at her own cost, so that her dining room made one think of an avant-garde Philistine exhibition. He fed at a little Russian restaurant which, he said, he had once slapped up, meaning that he had decorated its walls, he used an even richer expression, for he hailed from Moscow, where people are fond of waggish slang full of lush trivialities, I shall not attempt to render it. The funny part was, that in spite of his poverty, he had somehow managed to purchase a piece of ground, a three hours drive from Berlin, that is, he had somehow managed to make a down payment of a hundred marks, and did not bother about the rest, in fact, never meant to disgorge another penny, as he considered that the land, fertilized by his first payment, was henceforth his own till doomsday. It measured, that land, about two and a half tennis courts in length, and abutted on a rather beautiful little lake. A Y-stemmed couple of inseparable birches grew there, or a couple of couples, if you counted their reflections, also several black alder bushes, a little farther off stood five pine trees and still farther inland one came upon a patch of heather, courtesy of the surrounding wood. The ground was not fenced, there had not been money enough for that.
I strongly suspected Ardalian of waiting for the two adjacent allotments to get fenced first, which would automatically legitimate the boundaries of his property and give him an enclosure gratis, but the neighboring bits were still unsold. On the shores of that lake business was slack, the place being damp, mosquito-infested, and far from the village, then also there was no road connecting it with the highway, and nobody knew when that road would be made. It was, I remember, on a Sunday morning in mid-June that, yielding to Ardalian's rapturous persuasions, we went there for the first time. On our way we stopped to pick up the fellow. Long did I keep toot tooting, with my eyes fixed on his window. That window slept soundly. Lydia put her hands to her mouth and cried out in a trumpet voice, Ah dally oh oh. In one of the lower windows, just above the signboard of a pub, which, by its look, somehow suggested that Ardalian owed money there, a curtain was dashed aside furiously and a Bismarck-like worthy in frog dressing gown glanced out with a real trumpet in his hand. Leaving Lydia in the car, which by now had stopped throbbing, I went up to arouse Ardalian. I found him asleep. He slept in his one-piece bathing suit. Rolling out of bed, he proceeded with silent rapidity to slip on sandals, a blue shirt, and flannel trousers, then he snatched up a briefcase with a suspicious lump in its cheek and we went down. A solemn and sleepy expression did not exactly add charm to his fat-nosed face. He was put in the rumble seat. I did not know the way. He said he knew it as well as he knew his paternoster. No sooner had we left Berlin than we went astray. The rest of our drive consisted of making inquiries. A glad sight for a landowner, exclaimed Ardalian, when about noon we passed Königsdorf and then sped along the stretch of road he knew. I shall tell you when to turn. Hail, hail, my ancient trees. Don't play the fool, Ardy dear, said Lydia placidly. On either side there stretched rough wasteland, the sand and heather variety, with a sprinkling of young pines.
Then, farther on, the country changed a little, we had now an ordinary field on our right, darkly bordered at some distance by a forest. Ardalian began to fuss anew. On the right-hand side of the highway a bright yellow post grew up and at that spot there branched out at right angles a scarcely discernible road, the ghost of some obsolete road, which presently expired among burdocks and oatgrass. This is the turning, said Ardalian grandly and then, with a sudden grunt, pitched forward into me, for I had put on the brakes. You smile, gentle reader. And indeed, why should you not smile? A pleasant summer day and a peaceful countryside, a good-natured fool of an artist and a roadside post. That yellow post. Erected by the man selling the allotments, sticking up in brilliant solitude, an errant brother of those other painted posts, which, 17 kilometers farther toward the village of Waldau, stood sentinel over more tempting and expensive acres, that particular landmark subsequently became a fixed idea with me. Cut out clearly in yellow, amid a diffuse landscape, it stood up in my dreams. By its position my fancies found their bearings. All my thoughts reverted to it. It shone, a faithful beacon, in the darkness of my speculations. I have the feeling today that I recognized it, when seeing it for the first time, familiar to me as a thing of the future. Perhaps I am mistaken, perhaps the glance I gave it was quite an indifferent one, my sole concern being not to scrape the mudguard against it while turning, but all the same, today as I recall it, I cannot separate that first acquaintanceship from its mature development. The road, as already mentioned, lost itself, faded away, the car creaked crossly, as it bounced on the bumpy ground, I stopped it and shrugged my shoulders. Lydia said, I suggest, Ardy dear, we push on to Waldau instead, you said there was a large lake there and a cafe or something. That's out of the question, retorted Ardalian excitedly. Firstly, because the cafe is only just being planned, and secondly, because I have a lake too. Come on, my dear fellow, he continued, turning to me, make the old bus move, you won't be sorry.
In front of us, on higher ground, at a distance of some 300 feet, a pine forest began. I looked at it and, well, I can swear that I felt as if I had known it already. Yes, that's it, now I am getting it clear, I certainly did have that queer sensation, it has not been added as an aftertouch. And that yellow post. How meaningly it looked at me, when I glanced back, as if it was saying, I am here, I am at your service. And those pines facing me, with the bark resembling reddish snakeskin drawn on tight, and the green fir which the wind was stroking the wrong way, and that bare birch tree on the forest's edge. Now, why did I write bare? It was not winter yet, winter was still remote. And the day so balmy and almost cloudless, and the little stammering crickets zealously trying to say something beginning with Z. Yes, it all meant something, no mistake. May I ask, where you want me to move? I can't see any road. Oh, don't be so particular, said Ardalian. Go ahead, old son. Why, yes, straight on. There, where you see the break. We can just manage it, and once in the wood, it's quite a short run to my place. Hadn't we better get out and walk, proposed Lydia. Right you are, I replied, nobody would dream of stealing a new car abandoned here. Yes, much too risky, she admitted at once, but couldn't you two go along, Ardalian groaned, let him show you his place while I wait for you here and then we can proceed to Wildau and swim in the lake and sit in the cafe. How beastly of you, said Ardalian with great feeling. Can't you see that I wanted to welcome you on my own land? There were some nice surprises in store for you. I am now very hurt. I started the car, saying as I did so, well, if we smash it you pay for repairs. The jolts made me jump in my seat, beside me Lydia jumped, behind us Ardalian jumped and kept speaking, we shall soon bump get into the wood bump and then bump bump the heather will make it easier bump. We did get in. 
First of all we stuck in deep sand, the motor roared, the wheels kicked, at last we wrenched ourselves free, then branches came brushing against the car's body, scratching its paint. Some sort of path did finally show itself, now getting smothered in a dry crackle of heather, now emerging again to meander between the close-set trunks. More to the right, said Ardalian, a little more to the right. Well, what do you say to the smell of the pines? Gorgeous, eh? I told you so. Absolutely gorgeous. You may stop here while I go investigating. He got out and marched away with, at every step, an inspired waggle of his hindquarters. Hey, I'm coming too, cried Lydia, but he was going full sail and presently the dense undergrowth hid him. The engine clicked a little and was still. What a creepy spot, said Lydia. Really, I'd be afraid to stay here all by myself. One could get robbed, murdered, anything. A lonely spot, quite so. The pines soughed gently, snow lay about, with bald patches of soil showing black. What nonsense! How could there be snow in June? Ought to be crossed out, were it not wicked to erase, for the real author is not I, but my impatient memory. Understand it just as you please, it is none of my business. And the yellow post had a skullcap of snow too. Thus the future shimmers through the past. But enough, let that summer day be in focus again, spotty sunlight, shadows of branches across the blue car, a pine cone upon the footboard, where some day the most unexpected of objects will stand, a shaving brush. Is it Tuesday that they are coming? asked Lydia. I replied, no, Wednesday night. A silence. I do only hope, said my wife, they don't bring it with them as last time. And even if they do, why should you bother? A silence. Small blue butterflies settling on time. I say, Herman, are you quite certain it was Wednesday night?
Is the hidden sense worth disclosing? We were talking of trifles, alluding to some people we knew, to their dog, a vicious little creature, which engaged the attention of all present at parties, Lydia only cared for, large dogs with pedigrees, pronouncing, pedigrees, made her nostrils quiver. Why doesn't he come back, she said. He's sure to have lost himself. I got out of the car and walked around it. Paint scratched everywhere. Having nothing better to do, Lydia busied herself with Ardalian's lumpy briefcase, felt it, then opened it. I walked off a few steps, no, no, I cannot recall what it was I was brooding over, surveyed some broken twigs that lay at my feet, then turned back again. Lydia was now sitting on the footboard and whistling gently. We both lit cigarettes. Silence. She had a way of letting out smoke sideways, her mouth awry. From afar came Ardalian's lusty ball. A minute later he appeared in a clearing and brandished his arms, beckoning us on. We drove slowly after him, circumnavigating the tree trunks. Ardalian strode in front, his manner resolute and businesslike. Something flashed the lake. I have already described his lot. He was unable to show me its exact limits. With great stamping steps he measured the meters, stopped, looked back, half bending the leg supporting his weight, then shook his head and went to find a certain tree stump which marked something or other. The two enlaced birches looked at themselves in the water, there was some fluff floating on its surface, and the rushes gleamed in the sun. The surprise promised us by Ardalian turned out to be a bottle of vodka, which, however, Lydia had already managed to hide. She laughed and she gambled, for all the world like a croquet ball in her beige bathing costume with that double, red and blue stripe round the middle. When, after having had her fill of riding on Ardalian's back as he slowly swam about, don't pinch me, woman, or down you go, after much shrieking and spluttering, she came out of the water, her legs looked decidedly hairy, but soon they got dry, and a little bright bloom was all that showed.
Before taking a header Ardalian would cross himself, there was, along his shin, a great ugly scar left by the Civil War, from the opening in his repulsively flabby bathing suit the silver cross, of Mujik pattern, that he wore next to his skin, kept jumping out when he jumped in. Lydia dutifully besmeared herself with cold cream and lay down on her back placing herself at the disposal of the sun. A few feet away, Ardalian and I made ourselves comfortable in the shade of his best pine tree. From his sadly shrunken briefcase he produced a sketchbook, pencils, and presently I noticed that he was drawing me. You've a tricky face, he said, screwing up his eyes. Oh, do show me, cried Lydia without stirring a limb. Head a bit higher, said Ardalian. Thanks, that will do. Oh, do show me, she cried again a minute later. You first show me where you've chucked my vodka, muttered Ardalian. No fear, she replied. I won't have you drinking when I'm about. The woman is dotty. Now, should you suppose, old man, that she has actually buried it? I intended, as a matter of fact, quaffing the cup of brotherhood with you. I'll have you stop drinking altogether, cried Lydia, without lifting her greasy eyelids. Damned cheek, said Ardalian. Tell me, I asked him, what makes you say I have a tricky face? Where is the snag? Don't know. Lead doesn't get you. Next time I must try charcoal or oil. He erased something, flicked away the rubber dust with the joints of his fingers, cocked his head. Funny, I always thought I had a most ordinary face. Try, perhaps, drawing it in profile. Yes, in profile, cried Lydia, as before, spread eagled on the sand. Well, I shouldn't exactly call it ordinary. A little higher, please. No, if you ask me, I find there is something distinctly rum about it. All your lines sort of slip from under my pencil, slip and are gone.
such faces, then, occur seldom, that's what you mean. Every face is unique, pronounced Ardalian. Lord, I'm roasting, moaned Lydia, but did not move. Well, now, really, unique. Isn't that going too far? Take for instance the definite types of human faces that exist in the world, say, zoological types. There are people with the features of apes, there is also the rat type, the swine type. Then take the resemblance to celebrities, Napoleons among men, Queen Victorias among women. People have told me I reminded them of Amundsen. I have frequently come across noses a la Leo Tolstoy. Then, too, there is the type of face that makes you think of some particular picture. Icon-like faces, Madonnas. And what about the kind of resemblance due to some fashion of life or profession? You'll say next that all Chinamen are alike. You forget, my good man, that what the artist perceives is, primarily, the difference between things. It is the vulgar who note their resemblance. Haven't we heard Lydia exclaim at the talkies, ooh! Isn't she just like our maid? Ardy, dear, don't try to be funny, said Lydia. But you must concede, I went on, that sometimes it is the resemblance that matters. When buying a second candlestick, said Ardalian. There is really no need to go on taking down our conversation. I longed passionately for the fool to start talking about doubles, but he simply did not. After a while he put up his sketchbook. Lydia implored him to show her what he had done. He said he would if she gave him back his vodka. She refused and was not shown the sketch. The memory of that day ends in a sunshiny haze, or else mingles with the recollections of later trips. For that first one was followed by many others. I developed a somber and painfully acute liking for that lone wood with the lake shining in its midst.
Ardalian tried hard to bully me into making me meet the manager and acquire the piece of land next to his, but I was firm, and even had I been anxious to buy land, I should have failed all the same to make up my mind, as my business had taken a sorry turn that summer and I was fed up with everything, that filthy chocolate of mine was ruining me. But I give you my word, gentlemen, my word of honor, not mercenary greed, not merely that, not merely the desire to improve my position. It is, however, unnecessary to forestall events. <laughs>